Welcome to the MemberWise Best Practice Series. This video is brought to you today by the MemberWise Network, the leading free-to-join best practice network for membership and association professionals. We hope that you enjoy this great presentation and for further information about our growing network, please visit www.memberwise.org.uk. We're delighted to be here to, to share the RSS story uh, with you all. It's exceptionally bright up here. Uh, it's an inside-out story we're going to be sharing with you today. Um, it's going to be a squeeze for 30 minutes. If we're, we're talking very fast, that's why. Um, I'll start with some personal introductions. You're going to hear from two Jameses. That's me, Murphy, and him, Scott. Uh, I've been with RICS for 14 years uh, in a variety of roles as the organization's grown, and James has got over 10 years of digital consultancy experience with NetCell, working with a lot of not-for-profits, um, charities, uh, and membership organizations. And as you can see, we both have big dreams too. Uh, for those that don't know who RICS or NetCell are, um, here are some of the background facts, the purple and the pink, uh, the complementary pink, although we didn't choose to work with NetCell on that basis. Before I start in earnest, um, a quick spoiler alert. Um, I'm going to be talking about internal communications, I'm afraid. So I'm going to just ask you to all vote and let me know whether your role is concerned with internal communications. Oh, the tension. Congratulations, that's the right answer. <laughs> it's a bit of a trick question. Um, I think everybody should be concerned with internal communications. It doesn't mean you have to work in internal communications. And I'm going to show why you should be concerned, um, because it'll benefit your external communications. Oops, sorry, we jumped on. OK. Um, so RSS started working with NetCell around 18 months ago after a, a lengthy and pretty painful supplier selection. Uh, we wanted a partner who could help us develop our external digital face so that we look cleaner and more simple. And the reason for that is that complex organizations often have a complicated online presence. Or put another way, a confusing organization will appear confused. The UK government up to 2012 was famous for this and should now be a beacon of hope for us all as uh, Rob Smith highlighted in the, in the, in the first um, speech today. And this is something you're all familiar with. The latest member-wise Harnessing the Web 2016 survey results highlight this as a common concern. Somewhere down there. The reason for this concern is that as professional bodies, we are Olympic standard at complication. I'd like to illustrate this point, if I may. So here's just a snapshot from an excellent piece of work that we undertook at RICS prior to a global digital estate consolidation in 2012. Now, the red is a ring of digital organizational goals. Each goal is supported by at least one strategy, each strategy supported by a number of tactics. Each tactic is big enough to potentially be a goal in its own right and be supported by strategies and Tactics. It's pretty complicated stuff that we're all dealing with here. But the fact that the goals are arranged, radiating out from the center, exploding away from each other, I think is pretty telling. In many cases, these goals are conflicting rather than complementary. We want the money, but we want the satisfaction. We want to be global and locally relevant. And we want it all delivered efficiently, read cheaply, and with world-class governance. We are complicated, but we don't need to show it to our audiences, and we should never make it hard for them. Yet still, many professional bodies will insist that, first of all, users learn their language, their jargon, before they can interact. And it can take the most direct feedback to um, help you to appreciate this. So in 2012, flushed with the success of this pretty enormous new site launch, I needed to quickly recruit the team who were going to enhance and develop our new beast. So I started interviewing. Now, this particular candidate uh, was very junior, but looked very promising on paper. So I began with a classic test of a candidate's own research. We've all been there. I asked, could you please start by telling me what you know about RICS? I'd normally, at this point, sit back, 
get ready to tick off professional, regulation, status, standards, global, pride, respected. What I got was this. Now, that's not her, and she didn't get the job. I'm sure she wouldn't have answered like this. However, um, this response is actually incredibly, incredibly refreshing. This is how 18-year-olds see websites. They're places to transact, to buy, with information clearly laid out to achieve just that goal. Now, today we do have uh, a prized 18-year-old on my team, I'm delighted to say, and they're the best test and QA resource that you can possibly imagine. The greatest insight I got recently from her was that the top-level desktop navigation was completely invisible to her. She couldn't see it. She didn't know what she could do with it when she did see it, and this is because, of course, her world is mobile first and second, and we really need to start rethinking what we do for our new audiences. So assuming you're in a position to focus on the immediacy of your digital estate, then engagement is something you'll all be striving for. Engaged customers, receptive, and finding relevance in what you offer will become loyal customers and hopefully advocates. But this has been my concern and RSS's focus for a number of years as I developed our external digital communications. And in the latest MemberWise survey results, it's also clearly your top preoccupation. Now, I did warn you that I will be talking about internal comms. So here we go. Well, in last June, I took uh, responsibility for developing our depleted internal communications function. It was a team that was once three strong, had been merged, morphed, passed around, and found itself residing in the HR team, with no individual wholly responsible for it. I'm sure they're not watching this film. And down to just one dedicated person at that time. Internal comms lived in the world of HR, not in the world of communications and marketing, and not to bash HR too much, um, but just as I know very little about HR practice and policy, although I had to learn, those maintaining internal comms are often separated from communication specialist colleagues. Um, my own view of internal comms was that it was a poor relation of the wider communications world. And if you look at the resources dedicated to it this, at RICS, that's probably a fair summary of how others view it too. This is a pretty crude approximation of headcount of a picture today at RICS. Um, it may well be double the number of external communicators to internal. And, and I suspect that your organisations, um, if you're at a similar scale, will be, will be similar. But actually, internal communications and HR both fixate on this same word that we all do, engagement. It's all about employee engagement. Engaged employees stay loyal, work harder, take pride, tell their friends what an important place RSS is, and they cost less. Yet what I quickly realised is that achieving engagement is really only about getting you to the start line. What hope has an organisation got in achieving its business goals if the staff working within the organisation don't understand the values, the vision and the mission of the organisation? Uh, and this was something I think that James Maud has picked up on this morning. So I developed this model and it's pretty similar to external um, model for member satisfaction and communications. Except that we've replaced engagement replaces traditional member satisfaction. Understanding is vital. Alignment internally might be agreement externally. And the vital part here is, is really the one at the end. That's where you want to get to. It's the means to act that ties everything together, empowerment. So I think internal audiences should be the focus of much more investment, but you know, I would say that. Um, but they provide the bedrock for building credible messages externally. And I'd like to share with you a 12-month internal communications journey at RICS, starting somewhere in the middle. So in early 2016, we got this news. Uh, we'd achieved the incredible accolade of three-star, best not-for-profit company to work for on the Sunday Times list. In fact, we're the best eighth uh, not-for-profit 2016. So if numbers one to seven are here today, um, see me outside for a brown envelope. This is a measure of employee engagement, and it's a pretty fine one. It wasn't overnight, and it represents six years' worth of work and some backward steps over that time. But our recent digital developments played a major part in this success. Through social enterprise, enterprise social networking, we've been able to start making connections and establishing a culture of sharing, not by direction from the top, but by trust, 
and a facilitating social platform. So again, as you're all experts in internal communication here, I'd like to know how many of you are also using Enterprise Social. So my second show of hands, show of digital hands, is this question. Whether you're using Yammer or another internal social channel. If you don't know what Yammer is, the answer is no to this, okay? Okay, that's very interesting. And higher than I'd have expected, actually. We jump back to the slides. Okay, um, we introduced Yammer almost by stealth in August 2015, and it grew like a controlled underground movement. Um, behind me in fantastic low resolution are some of the ways from the very ephemeral to the more significant that my colleagues have taken to Yammer. Now with enterprise social you think you're adding a social collaborative element to your organisation and of course you are. But really what you're doing is boosting engagement, empowering colleagues, breaking silos and opening up knowledge pockets, flattening your organisation structure threatening middle and senior managers, absolutely love that one, allowing the switched on to shine, bringing the brand to life, owning the discussion but not dominating the discussion, facilitating, guiding, and scaring the hell out of HR. Just ending this cycle on this slide, I think this is a really, really important element that you get with enterprise social you get the ability to crowdsource answers. So the organization can ask this, does anyone? Does anyone know? So think about your contact center, think about inbound inquiries, think about connecting colleagues. Does anyone know who does this? Does anyone know who did that? Does anyone know the answer to this? Um, and we've seen how these can grow and these threads are, are, are take, catch fire across colleagues in different teams and different time zones. So we built it and they came and a team of 2.5-ish internal comms uh, colleagues became 800 plus. This is um, colleagues responding on Yammer to what they were doing to give something back. And so far, so fun, but the brief I have for our internal comms is to make them and us as an organization externally focused. We need to understand and talk the language of business and of our customers. We need to move a little bit beyond the photos of cake and there are a lot of photos of cake. I particularly love this one. This is the, uh, a number of the element of people in the core digital team. And what you'll see in the back, right at the top, is our so social media manager, ever vigilant. <laughs> this is about boosting the understanding of all colleagues about what we do, why we do it, and where we're going. Like your organizations, we do a huge amount of stuff. It's a consequence of and a contributor to the notion of the confused organization. So focus your colleagues around strong core content and build out your stories. I committed when taking on internal comms to move from a business plan annual launch to ongoing business plan communications. <clears throat> These are our seven strategic projects this year. We're probably doing 250 plus projects this year, but these are the top seven that colleagues will see developing in our communications each week. And you can see in the the weekly newsletter, there's the same icon repeated. You get to, to know these things. They've come from a careful reading and rereading of our business plan. The purpose of this is to build understanding across colleagues, firstly for our vision, and secondly for how we're organizing ourselves to deliver against this. So what I hope is that all colleagues will be able to reflect on their own position and understand how it aligns and supports the priorities and vision. This is about moving from engagement through understanding to alignment, and I'll illustrate this with a brief anecdote. Meet Rolf. This dashing chap is our country manager for Germany, Austria, and Switzerland, where we have about 3,000 qualified professionals. Rolf spends a lot of his time on the road connecting with key accounts, prospects, employers, students, qualified professionals. I met with Rolf earlier this year in Frankfurt and walked him through our internal comms model. Rolf sat back and said, but James, no, no accent. He's got a very heavy accent. <laughs> but James, my job is about engaging our professionals in Germany. I'm sorry, but growing offices and training in China is simply not for me. 
It's a good point. I need you to think quickly on this one. Now, across us was, across from the road from our office in Frankfurt is, when it appears, this building. Ah, there we are. This building. It's the European headquarters of the world's largest bank, this bank. So the Chinese are across the road from us. I asked if it was the case that Germany, like the UK, had major infrastructure increasingly funded through Chinese investment. Yes, the autobahns, he said. So Chinese investment is helping to carry Rolf faster to his meetings. Work me on this one. Meetings with construction and property professionals who will be overseeing and making large deals with the Chinese. And as a little post-meeting research, I thought this was fun. The largest Chinese investment in German property this year is actually into autobahn service stations. It's about making it relevant to Rolf. This is a pretty flimsy example, I take it, but suddenly he can see and, and there's a hook into the conversations that he's having. So it's maybe good that we're influencing training and building an RICS presence in China. Rolf has now got a proactive message he can take to his members. So we have evidence of engagement, understanding, alignment amongst our colleagues, but what can they do about it? Well, for me, digital is a great democratizer. It's a great leveler. It allows us to break unnecessary cascades and remove those who hold on to their position simply by holding on to information. So trust your colleagues. Give them the information and tools they need to, met to act. Make it personal and relevant, and trust that they won't abuse those tools and information, and they will do good things. Remember when social channels were blocked at work? I'm hoping they're not blocked at anyone's work anymore. The world didn't end up when they were suddenly opened, and a grown-up organization can make mistakes and get over them. So with Yammer at the center, an increasing use of video, this is how we're pulling engaging business-focused content inside the organization into an empowering means for the new intranet that we've just rolled out. What's different here is that we're using user-first approaches that we've always developed externally to create our own digital workplace. Engagement comes from equitable sharing of business information, bringing people together around what's important to the business and to them, building their profile and status. It's not so wildly different from the external membership landscape. Today's internets are fascinating to look at. They're ruthless, they really are. They're ruthlessly functional. The best contain just the information your colleagues need to do their jobs, with the tools to access their colleagues, find each other, and collaborate. Their document management, workflow, social, collaboration, sketchpad, all in one. Increasingly in the cloud, they're accessible on work or personal equipment without clumsy network restrictions. This is what we've just developed. This slide from step two, an Australian consultancy, could have been produced to describe the best membership, modern membership or professional body website centered on personalization, functional, a place for doing and connecting with content that's timely, relevant, and focused, aiding understanding and serving not to confuse. So RSCS is not there yet, but I believe that this internal journey is the essential starting point if you want to build effective external digital communication and ultimately empowered advocates. Engagement shouldn't be the top, top topic of conversation here next year. It should be what you're built upon. Galvanizing your colleagues around the central business mission and priorities means you can start to project these coherently via your external digital put touch points. We've seen that complicated organizations often have a complicated digital presence, and we've started to simplify ours at RICS, and James is going to pick up the story. Thank you, James. So, um, believe me, uh, so James has created a, a honey trap, really, with Yammer to get people uh, using the intranet at RICS. Um, and believe me, that's the best image that comes up if you Google honey trap. Um, but, uh, so I'm going to tell you a little bit more about how we've been working together and how we're going to continue to work together over the coming years uh, on the external digital estate. It's less a, a story of the birds and the bees and actually uh, the story of a horse, an elephant, and a frog shown here and there natural habitat, 100% uh, accurate uh, to each other in terms of proportions. Um, but before we make sense of this uh, menagerie of analogies in the animal kingdom, I'm just going to talk a little bit more about how and why our relationship with RSCS works as harmoniously as it does. Put simply, uh, 
the anecdotal evidence from the clients that, that come and work with us is that the reason they started to look for a new partner was because their incumbent didn't really investigate or challenge their requirements uh, deeply enough. Whereas at NetSell, we tend to dig a little deeper, scratch beneath the surface to find the requirements behind the requirements. And the RICS, RICS is a, a progressive organisation. They didn't come to us with a brief which was, can you help us redesign our website? They wanted us to work with them strategically from the outset, so they were ready to tell us what they really, really wanted. The, uh, so yeah, the pitch was, how can you help us strategically? Uh, it's a very complex organisation. Can you bring some fresh perspective, uh, some outside influence to that? And we said, well, before you can really develop a strategy, you need a vision. You need to look into the future and start to hypothesise, what does the perfect RICS experience look like for different key audiences? And then we can work back from there. This echoes a lot of what Kerry was talking about from Law Society earlier. Um, then we can come up with the appropriate strategy once we know really where we're going. At NetSell, we have a, a five-point framework that we use for this sort of process. So, um, I don't know if you can see that at the top, there's a piece called origination. A lot of you might call that discovery or investigation. That's where we get to know about the organisation, their strengths, the challenges, their comparators, competitors, um, and really what they're trying to achieve. And then because we're starting with the end in mind, we work counterclockwise. We go across to look at what does success look like and, and how do we measure that? And that's what we call conversion. And then we work back from there to say, well, okay, to, to deliver those results, what kind of experience would you need to deliver? So um, how do you optimize the user experience through personalization, multilingual content, de device-specific interaction, uh, and so on? Then we look at attraction. Sorry, let's go back. My fault. Uh, let's we look at attraction, which is um, how do you drive traffic into that experience through social channels, SEO, marketing automation? And then, and only then, do we look at foundations. So what do you need to put in place technically uh, and in terms of people, systems, process, governance, etc., to deliver all of that, all of the above? So at this pitch stage with RICS, um, we didn't have access to hardly any of that information. So off our own backs, we went and did some, some user engagement. We found uh, some representatives of some of the key target audiences, and we did some traditional user engagement and got them in front of the website and asked them to vocalize their opinions about some of the key user journeys that they would typically go on. Um, and that gave us lots and lots of feedback, pages and pages of feedback about what was wrong, what could be improved across a number of different areas of the website. Um, and that meant that we were able to develop a homepage concept that would take the website from this to something that would look a bit more like this. So again, just a concept at the moment, but I'll, I'll explain what's behind this uh, and the, find the key findings that influence this. So the main issue here is that logged in users uh, weren't really seeing the value of being logged in. They, nothing really changed for them. And uh, they could access more content, but they weren't really sure how to get to it. And worst of all, they found that there was content that was irrelevant to them getting in the way. So if they were a, a commercial property uh, surveyor, they were getting content about agriculture or residential, for example. So um, our creative director came up with this mantra of simplify, prioritize, signpost, and, and that's where we came up with this idea of a dashboard. The point here is that your members are, are probably time poor because everybody is. Um, and they don't want to search for content, they don't want to surf for content. What we're doing here is using personalization to push content to them based on their behavior and based on their interests. So the uh, EpiServer CMS that RICS use um, has a personalization engine built in, which will look at well, what content categories have I shown interest in. But that becomes really powerful when you integrate with CRM. So we can look at things like purchase history of books, events, where they are in their CPD, and that really helps us fine tune the content that we will, will show to the user. And it also means that if we know you've been on a conference in London, um, on say dilapidations, we'll point you at the right sort of content. We'll say, well, here's a LinkedIn discussion that you might want to be part of. Here's a, a book you should buy uh, about that, that, that subject matter. And we can downgrade content about things that are in Birmingham or, or areas that are, are clearly not of interest. Um, so yeah, we can use taxonomy here to cross-promote products and services, um, and that in turn maximizes member engagement, member satisfaction, and of course the, the cross-sell, upsell opportunities for the organization. But that's all a theory. Remember, this was just a concept. So what we'd have ideally done at that point was have entered into some much deeper stakeholder engagement with RICS. We'd have done some more user engagement. 
We'd have looked at uh, the data for the site, uh, some industry reports. We'd have looked at social media sentiment and, uh, and presence. Then we look at things like, once we've identified the key challenges, who else is doing this really well? So if, if it's about finding a location, who else is out there that's got nothing to do with RSCS that, that's rising to that challenge very effectively? So that means looking at some comparators outside of the immediate space. It means looking at some comparators inside the immediate space. And the other thing that we like to do at Netsell is get hands-on. So we'll actually go and attend uh, events or, or courses. And even though the subject matter will be way over our heads, um, it just gives us that full flavor of, of what the user is experiencing end-to-end. And then we put that in context of the work we've done with other organizations and our own expert review. But that doesn't mean we get a blank check. Um, what we had to do then was find a, a, a small but significant project where we could prove some of these concepts. So uh, if you remember the horse I was telling you about earlier, it was actually a Trojan horse. So uh, James told me that his team had been given the remit to do some design updates to the homepage at an aesthetic level because there was some new branding. Brilliant. What we could do because we also luckily had a remit to do some audience development to relook at who the users are and what they're trying to achieve. It meant that we could apply the learning from that research and deliver some, some serious results on, on what was seen as a fairly low key, very high profile, but otherwise low key project. So that gave us uh, nine key persona. We did some more user engagement, but effectively we had these pen portraits that we could use to, um, to sense check any ideas that were coming out through the creative process. And where that led us to was a, a much decluttered homepage. So what we've got here is simplified, prioritized, signposted content based on the terms that users would use rather than departmental terms or structural terms. So just a sort of before and after there, you can see how hopefully that uh, speaks for itself in terms of how much easier that will be to, to have a starting point into your journey on RSCS. And we even got a version of our dashboard concept into that release. So aesthetically, we're working within the existing uh, build, uh, but, and, and that will develop over time. But the results have been um, pretty phenomenal anyway. So um, bounce rate is down, I think, about 40%. We've got the numbers through now. Traffic up about 25%. Interestingly, um, if we just go back, when you show people a picture of themselves that's old or they've got a grey avatar there that represents their gender, um, uh, they, they rush in to change that. So 360% increase to profile management pages once we launch this new, new uh, page. Um, and member satisfaction is also up. So you, uh, RSS do a regular survey uh, and those stats are, are also up as well. And what this means is that we are now following this understanding, alignment, empowerment type exercise. We've engaged them by showing them an ugly picture of themselves. We've got them to understand what the RSS is trying to achieve in those three entry points. We've aligned with their objectives because they are um, trying to achieve certain things with CPD, etc. And we've empowered them to self-serve. 40% uh, reduction in calls to the call centre that were unnecessary. So now the call center is dealing only with, with calls that really require their intervention. There's no more, how do I change my picture, or uh, I've forgotten my login, et cetera. That's all managed uh, directly within the site. So how do we roll this out? Well, everybody's happy. How do we roll this out to the rest of the site? Well, it's the same answer to the age-old question of how do you eat an elephant? There's lots of elephants in this room today. Um, so here's another one, um, which is, of course, a piece at a time. But then how do you choose which piece of the elephant to eat? And I'm really sorry, all you vegans out there. Um, but um, Another, my last business speak cliche will be that you have to swallow the frog. So uh, the, uh, the frog for our ICS is uh, training and events. We're working through a whole program, mapping the touch points of how do people research events, how do they um, consider which ones they want to buy onto, um, what's the buying, the transactional process like, what happens before the event, at the event, and after the event. I think uh, I haven't got very much time left. Have I, Richard? How long have we got? One minute. Okay. So, very quickly, in this very room two weeks ago, our ICS launched one of the ideas that we pitched to them, which was an events app. So, this is an app that helps uh, people in situations like the one we're in today know where the toilets are, know what the speaker list looks like, the itinerary, um, get all the presentations downloaded to the app, etc. So, it's really great to start seeing that type of engagement come to, to fruition, and we're adding that into our touch point mapping. So we followed this program, we're considering the foundations last, um, and uh, 
one of the key things that I'll just pick up when we do the takeaways is that it isn't just about technology or creativity, it's, it is definitely also about governance. If you, if you only tackle these things from a creative and technical perspective, um, then in six to 12 months you'll have unkempt content, uh, out of date content, broken links, etc., etc. I'll skip this, but this is essentially the rollout plan for RICS. Uh, we're following an iterative agile process to get us ready for World Built Environment Forum in March 2018. Uh, which coincides with the 150th anniversary of the organisation. Uh, and I'll just quickly recap then on, on my slides before I hand over to James. So start with the end in mind, define the ideal experience, back that up with plenty of research, um, deploy a Trojan horse if you must, do a proof of concept, eat the elephant, come up with an, an ongoing plan of agile iterative development, but tackle the, the, the nastiest things first, the things that you think are going to uh, be the most difficult. Because once you've solved those problems, you'll be easily able to solve most of the other less significant problems. And then uh, don't forget about governance and resourcing. So I won't recap on that because we've just talked about it. OK, and just to finalise, that, that's all great, but you need the solid foundations. So. <laughs> Back, back to aligning um, internally within the organisation and my five points which broadly overlap with these to close on are that you might not be in control of your internal communications but you must be concerned with them. It sounds like most of you here are, that's great. Engagement isn't the start, uh, sorry, it's just the start, it's not the end. Always refer to your business plan. If the priorities are understood internally, you can communicate these effectively externally and it'll kill any, any wider discussions or debate. Consider your approach to the non-aligned. I haven't done that in, in these slides, but there will be people, members and colleagues, who are not aligned when you do that exercise, staff and members. Do you convert them? Do you put your energies there, or do you try and manage them out? It's over to you. Uh, and next year, I would just leave on, um, we need to move the conversation beyond engagement into the empowered organisation. Thank you very much. Okay.